Now, uh, to give you our first speaker and the fellow Canadian who is living proof that you can actually work in InfoSec for what, several decades and not become an empty, hollow husk of a, of a human. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks. David. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. This is actually a great privilege for me to be able to be here for your first B-Sides. Um, I have been, well, first off, let me introduce myself. Uh, I have been in InfoSec now for about 25 plus years, and I have been doing this long enough that, yeah, I am actually a bit of a jaded, empty husk now. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way for you. When I started out, there were no masters of information security courses. There were no textbooks that we really could rely on in a big way. We had to go through and read our FCs and just poke things to see how they would go until they actually broke. And it was really interesting in that regard. I have been in all sorts of roles. I've been a firewall admin right through to being a CISO for a uh, power company and all points in between. And it's absolutely amazing how much you learn along the way simply by interacting with others. Now, I've been very fortunate in my career that a lot of what I've got to do is I, I'm on the board of directors for B-Sides Las Vegas. I helped found Toronto's B-Sides and I helped work on B-Sides London. This is something that all of you can contribute because this is your conference. This is your ability to share information. I was talking to somebody this morning where they said, you know, a lot of conferences out there, it's very expensive for people to go to. <coughs> and that's true. Something like this is community driven and this is something that you benefit from by what you give into it. Don't think about what you can take away from it. You can contribute too. So let's do this really quick. I know I've gone on a bit of a tangent here, but a show of hands, how many people here have ever given a security talk before? Okay, the ones that didn't put up your hands, I hope you're gonna apply next year. I really do, sincerely. <coughs> so, as I said, I've been doing this for quite a long time, and I personally identify myself as a hacker. Um, and if you quickly go through and check out on Google, people don't like us much, but we're really there to help. And being Canadian, we tend to like, really like to help because that's what we do um, when we're not drinking beer and eating bacon. But the easiest way to spot a Canadian is look at us in our natural habitat. We're usually dressed like a homicidal maniac going across a sheet of ice. I work for Duo Security as a global security advi ad sorry, global advisory CISO, and that means I just run around and talk to people in a lot of ways. Um, and this has been a really amazing opportunity for me because it gets me to events like this where I can talk to you and share the lessons learned and things mistakes I've made along the way. Now back in October, Cisco came along and bought us up, and I'll be honest, I was nervous at first. Honestly, this has actually turned out to be a really beneficial thing. We went from a 700-person shop to 80,000 people overnight, and it's actually working. So that's kind of cool. And one of the really interesting things is we helped build ourselves a lingua franca between the two organizations as we went along, and this is something that tends to be overlooked when you're talking about data breaches. And there's going to be a few companies that I mentioned during the course of this, no, none of them from Norway, um, that have had data breaches, and this is by no means to make them look bad. This is to work about talking about lessons learned and sharing the information from these data breaches in such a way that we can constructively move forward. So one of the things that I did when I first started building out this talk is I went through and I read all of the publicly available uh, data breach disclosures uh, for uh, this was two years ago and then again last year. And if you ever have trouble sleeping, this is a great solution. But the really funny thing is, is I went through all of these data breach notifications. I really found that there was no common lingua franca. There was no common understanding as to how to explain this to a wider audience. Because in a lot of cases, these organizations don't want to share too much, and I understand that because there's legal liability and things to that effect. But this would help us in a bigger way if they could share more information in a sanitized fashion to protect the guilty parties. Now, the security paradigm that we tend to operate on is having a perimeter, having a castle walls, having a moat. But back in 410 AD, we found that demonstrably to be a broken security paradigm. Before I ever got into security at all, I was doing a degree, and I apologize for my thick Canadian accent. Um, I, one of the things I was doing is I was doing a degree in classical studies and archaeology. A long story how I got here. But one of the stories that I took away from that was the sack of Rome in 410 AD. And this is when the Visigoths showed up. They sealed off the city from any in, anything coming in or out. 
And over time, the Romans ran out of food, they ran out of supplies, eventually they gave up and opened the doors. So the attackers were able to use their own security paradigm against them in such a way that they were able to be defeated. And that's just it. We have to constantly look at how we're doing security in our organizations and to the wider uh, field at large so that we make sure that we're adapting to things like this that we've known about for several thousand years, a couple thousand years. Um, yeah. So data breaches, th this is not something new. This is something that I you know, follow myself rather religiously. So for here, you know, we had back in 2005, there were 40 million records where it came out. This was huge news at the time. To be followed on by Heartland Payment Systems in 2009, this was another massive data breach. And this was really amazing because at that time, these were big numbers. We flash forward today, this is not even something that people would consider newsworthy. So this was a lot of the problem as to why. A lot of data breach, data breaches, a lot of databases rather, had XP command shell was something that was built in as a script that would allow remote man management of a database. This was something that was built with all the right intentions. But the law of unintended consequences being what they are, uh, a lot of these databases had this enabled and they were publicly accessible. So data breach after data breach started to happen. In one power company that I was working at, I had sat there while we were having a penetration test done, and I saw them trying to do this, and I had actually disabled that. I called them up, and I said, yeah, <laughs> nice try. And they're like, who told you that we were doing that? They were actually shocked that we were checking our IDS system to see that something was actually happening. That was more telling than anything else that their customers usually didn't monitor their own systems. And we've seen other companies that will remain nameless over the years that weren't actually monitoring the systems they had in place. And this is something that we can fix. It's within our power. So XP Command Shell was a big thing back in the day, but if we jump forward to today, we're, thinking of, we're talking about things like S3 buckets. So on AWS, they have a thing called S3. How many people here by show of hands are familiar with S3 buckets? OK, cool. If for those of you who don't know, please look it up. This is really interesting. It's a data repository that you can spin up uh, through a web interface you can put image files, you can put text files, whatever it happens to be, into that repository. But unfortunately, a lot of times people are putting it up there in such a way that it's publicly accessible because it's easier for them to get their applications working. Mm, bit of a problem because those things can be iterated. There are scanners that are freely available on GitHub. You can download and you can run them against AWS. Not that I recommend that, but you can find open resources all over the place. And a lot of data breaches in the last year have centered around this. The really interesting thing about this is with regards to these AWS uh, S3 buckets is that they are locked down by default. They are private by default. I'm going to say that again. Private by default. Unfortunately, people enable them because they don't quite know how to put in the proper rules. And whose fault is that? As security practitioners, it's our fault. This is one of those moments where we have to take that sword and put it against the tip of our, or put the tip of the sword against our chest, rather, and lean forward because we need to own that mistake because we need to do a better job of educating those who are enabling these things. Because I guarantee you, nine times out of 10, those aren't security people that are allowing that access. And the breaches just keep coming. There's all sorts of these. Not to say that this was a SQL injection attack or anything like that, but this was just an example of this can happen to literally anyone. But the funny thing is, is with the data breaches, we tend not to pay attention to it until it affects us personally. This is really an amazing thing when you think about it. So for example, if you are out and about and you leave your door open because you're used to doing that and wherever it happens to be that you live, and somebody breaks in and steals your stuff, all of a sudden you feel violated. At that point, what would you do? Put in an alarm. Put in all kinds of different controls. Why weren't those controls in place before? I'm not saying you have to go out and put an alarm on your house, but at least lock the door. These are you know, the risk discussions you have to have because the data breaches are going to continue to happen, much like home invasions and all the rest of it. It's not something to be afraid of, it's something to be aware of, something to be dealt with in a proper fashion. Because data is no longer, or rather, currency is no longer anything other than data. Data has become the currency of the day. And what slide presentation would be complete without you know, the requisite AI nonsense? So this is really interesting because there has been so much discussion around AI and how it can be used by attackers. But the funny thing is the attackers don't need to use it because we continually leave vulnerable systems exposed to the internet. 
We're continually leaving systems with default credentials that are freely available and easy to find. This is something that we can collectively do a better job to help mitigate. But that being said, the problem is going to happen. So a few years ago, like one of the things I do is I work on speaker operations for DEF CON, and we were trying to get set up for DEF CON, and the day before we had the uh, DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge was on the stage at the same time. So each one of these systems across here was a uh, supercomputer, uh, liquid cooled, you should have seen these huge cables behind it, it was absolutely massive. So we had to pick our way across the back of that, but each one of these systems was attacking each other. One of these systems created an exploit to use against the other systems that nobody had seen before. So the ability for a supercomputer to cause real problems, yes. AI to cause real problems, yes, it does exist. But honestly, we're not at the point where we need to worry about that yet. Most AI systems, or most companies that say they have an AI system, tends to be a glorified if-then-else statement. But, you know, I might be jaded. Yeah. And case in point, when the Equifax data breach happened, this was really amazing. Everybody was going on about the vulnerability in the system that they were like, oh, they got exploited, da, da, da. Brian Krebs went out and found this. This was a web interface that was available in, I believe it was 26 different countries, with default username and password where you could get in, you could get all the exact same data. You didn't have to run any exploit, you didn't have to drop any zero day. There it was. This is one of those things, the law of unintended consequences is a rather remarkable animal. So, when we're talking about security-related issues, we are looking at unauthorized access, insider threats, and yeah, everybody likes to go on about that, web breaches, and, oh right, what's the one thing that we never really talk about too much is the missing patches. So, for a great example, Oracle databases. When's the last time you placed, uh, had, or your organization installed Oracle database patches, security patches? So this is one of those things. A lot of the organizations I worked at over the years, we come up and have that question whenever we had a penetration test done, and they say, oh, yeah, we, we're you know, about two years behind. It, th this would absolutely drive me to distraction. But it can be better than that. But one of the things I really do enjoy is a lot of popular culture. So one movie, uh, Rogue One, that came out, and if you haven't already seen it, there's some spoilers in here. And it's been a while, so I imagine everybody's seen it. So. This was a great movie for talking about data breaches. So in one scene, we have the firewall admin here. He's trying to gauge whether or not the rebel ship that's trying to gain access into their planet is legitimate. And they're like, wait a second, that's an older code. Why are you here? You're not scheduled to be here. And they're like, yeah, no, no, it's cool. We got redirected. So you know, we're supposed to be here. We got to pick up you know, something for Bob. OK. Well. Then they said, send the legitimate code, so there goes the SQL injection, and then, oh, they pop the box. They have now gained access. But once they've gained access, the attacker really has to go, okay, how can we go beyond what we already have? So they have to escalate privilege. And as they're going through and they're gaining the extra information, they are really doing a lot of damage to that organization, and it's not until it's too late that we see the indicators of compromise. Once the bombs start going off across the base, then that's a real problem. Sorry, Julie, you get that? <laughs> but by that point, the damage is already done. And the data is already leaving the building. But what was the ultimate lesson from all of this? Oh, there it goes. What was the ultimate lesson from all of this? Encrypt your data. So all of this data they had for this massive Death Star was not in an encrypted state. But data breaches have been something that I have been rather passionate about for a very long time. So back in 2012, I started tracking them on my own site, Liquid Matrix. And I went through, and this was really amazing. At that time, LinkedIn, as an example, six, uh, basically 6.5 million records were exposed. This was big news back then. Today we have orders of magnitude of a billion records. What does this tell you? One, we need to do a whole lot better job at securing our data. But two, static usernames and passwords, mm, really something that is a, something that we have to move beyond. And I know what I'm talking about. Years ago, I was part of a company that we got breached. I came into work in the morning, and I sat down at my desk. I had my coffee, and I went, whoa, what's this? There was a stack of notes on my desk for various 
media companies that had called to talk to me about the data breach. And I was like, what data breach? Looked at my phone, 27 missed calls. Fantastic. This was really disconcerting. Now, this was a system that was a deprecated system. It was running an old, vulnerable version of WordPress. And the funny thing was, is two weeks before this data breach, we had a talk with a group that was managing it. We said, could you please do something about this? Either patch it or take it offline. They're like, oh, it's a deprecated system. We we're actually retiring it. And we're like, fantastic. Two weeks later, the funny thing about this was it wasn't, I don't blame them for not taking it offline. I blame myself and my own team for not following up. And with security, you have to constantly be following up. Trust, but verify, and then verify again. Because the attackers are going to keep coming. In my previous job, one of the things that we did, we did a state of the internet report that we go through and look at all the data for all the different types of web attacks. And quarter over quarter, these three were always the same. SQL injection, local file inclusion, and cross-site scripting were always the top three attacks. Why? Because they worked. Specifically, SQL injection worked time and time again. Now, this is from a site called informationisbeautiful.net. If you're not familiar with it, I definitely suggest checking it out if you're into data visualization, like myself. So this was two years ago. This was their graphical representation of various data breaches. The colors just uh, indicate you know, big stories of the day. Now, we jumped to just a couple months ago. And now we have this. And the reason they did this is because they couldn't fit it all on the page anymore. They had to change the way they were representing the data. Disconcerting, no? And it really feels like almost everybody out there wants to have a data breach. And this is troubling on many ways because I do some work on the side with a company, a boutique firm called Securosis, and we went through and we looked at data breaches, and a lot of the companies that were breached, actually almost exclusively all of them, saw a bump in their stock price after the data breach happened. That was a bit disconcerting. And I don't know if it was people figure, oh, lightning can't strike twice, or what the kind of logic was there. But it was really odd to see that data in front of us. Now, you want to make sure that you're having proper security controls in place. You want to make sure that you're limiting access to resources. You want to look at network zone segmentation. This is something we have been doing for years, or should have been doing for years. I worked in one organization about 10-ish years ago. We had a flat network with MPLS circuits spanning the globe. I could sit at my desk in Toronto, and I could query systems in Kuala Lumpur. And nobody knew that I was doing it because they didn't have logging turned on. We fixed that rather quickly, thankfully. But you want to make sure you have the proper security controls in place. Not all security controls are created equal. And we have to look at the things that we should have been doing all along, because bad things can happen. This is a great example. All of these systems compromised using a vulnerability we had known about for 10 plus years. Here's a pop quiz, OWASP top 10. How many people here can tell me how long SQL injection has been on the top 10? There are no wrong answers. You can just shout them out. Anybody? I, I heard something over there, but I, I'll go with forever. Yes, from day one, basically. Why is this happening? This is something we have within our ability to fix. If you sanitize your inputs and you sanitize your outputs, that problem goes away, or at least is mitigated, I should say. So how much is this going to cost? The reality is, is you're going through. And if you have a data breach in your systems, there are costs involved. The cost of investigating the incident. Look at the number of people that you're committing to tracking down the information, to remediating the issues, to going through and saying, you know, what actually happened? There is a cost for each one of those employees that are spending their time when they could have been doing something else. To remediate. Some organizations, that is not a cheap thing to do. One power company that I worked at quite a few years ago, we had one vulnerability we found. They had hard-coded usernames and passwords in their uh, human interface, uh, H, uh, HMI. This was absolutely maddening. We asked them to fix it, and they said, sure, that'll be $250,000. It's like, wow. Um, 
that is well Canadian dollar, so it's a little bit funny money. Um, but th there is an absolute cost to recovering your systems. Look at Sony Pictures as an example. They had their system compromised. All of their systems were wiped. They went down to bare metal. They had whiteboards in order to get work done. Can you imagine that happening in your own organization, that you are reduced to using whiteboards and typewriters? Now you've got to communicate with the external audience. When a data breach happens, if you're a publicly traded company, you have a fiduciary responsibility to communicate with your stockholders. There is a cost to having that communication set up. External PR firms, internal PR firms, all of that sort of thing. What are the legal costs? GDPR is always a fun one, but I'm not going to go there. And compliance penalties. In some organizations out there, they find it cheaper to pay the penalty than it is to fix the problem. I'm not going to name anyone, but this is another thing where we have to look at it and go, this is a problem. You got to worry about the loss of revenue. So in one organization that I was working at where we had that data breach, luckily that particular data breach only had 192 accounts on it, and thankfully none of them were on the rest of the network. Um, but still, the reputational damage was done. That same company, we had an email go out that should never have left the organization. It even said on the email, do not share this externally. Within two minutes of that email being sent around externally, it had left the building 27 times. Our stock price dipped, and it cost the company millions of dollars in the space of five minutes. You got to worry about customer attrition. Are you going to lose customers because of a data breach? Something to consider. And like I said, your stock could be affected. And there's other costs, too. So for example, here, Verizon was going to buy uh, Yahoo, and they Yahoo had not been 100% forthcoming with regards to their own data breach. Once this came to light, that took 350 million US off the price tag. They said, nope, we're just going to drop the price. And they said, yeah, we, you got us. We can't do anything about that. This is a real danger. And there's other companies, too, that'll say, oh, we don't have to do encryption because we are not legally mandated to do it. Or you could do the right thing and not have to worry about it after the fact when the lawyers show up with their pointy teeth. So in the... Uh, um, sorry, jet lag just caught me there. In the Equifax data breach, this was amazing. Who got the pink slip in that particular scenario? Let's go through. The CISO, who made $11 million in four years, I'm in the wrong business, was retired. The CIO, I'm sure the CIO was fine. Nope, CIO retired. Well, I'm sure the CEO was able to take over and have no problem there. Nope, CEO retired with a $90 million US parachute. Now, imagine for a second, if your entire C-suite was wiped out just like that. How would your organization be able to recover? This is the thing, when we talk about data breaches, it's not just a case of, ha they got popped, that doesn't do anybody any good. You have to look at the bigger picture. How, are the, how is that going to affect your organization? How is it going to affect your customers, or your end users, your citizens, whatever it happens to be? And it's not just Equifax to balance it out. Here's an example, and hopefully this works, yes. TransUnion, they're one of their competitors, the next day was trying to install Flash on systems, but it wasn't Flash. It can happen to anyone. So one of the things that, in all the roles that I've been in over my career, I have had the benefit of doing different types of jobs. I have worked as a penetration tester. I've worked as a CISO. I've even done compliance. Now, the really interesting thing is compliance can be a friend for you in your organization. I know most people roll their eyes in the back of their skulls until they crack, but they can often be a balance, and that's just it. You want to work within the different groups within your organization in order to achieve a common goal. And if you can get them on your side, this is a great idea. <laughs> often compliance is the adult in the room. So I remember one time, years and years ago, I went into the CIO's office and I said, we have a problem, this particular system can be remotely rooted, and we got to buy this particular tool in order to fix this issue, and blah, blah, blah. And the CIO looked at me and he said, well, what's this going to cost? And I went, I didn't know how to answer it. And that's just it. It's incumbent upon us as security practitioners to learn how to speak to senior management in terms they understand. 
They want to know about risk. They want to know about costs. These are the things that are going to resonate with the senior management. Now, mistakes can often happen. Now, back in the 90s, I was working for a defense contractor in the US, which is odd and not that I was a Canadian, but that's another thing entirely. So in one particular scenario, the customer that I was working at was under attack over and over again, and I kind of lost my cool, and I hit back. The organization I went after, I got into their system, I left a note. I didn't destroy anything, I didn't take anything down, but I left a note on the desktop of the particular system and I said, these are the issues, if you want to drop me, here's a burner email address, you can send me a line. Two days later, I got an email. It said, hey, really sorry about that, but that wasn't us. That being said, thank you for pointing out the various vulnerabilities and cataloging for them in this note. We were able to remedy that and we really do appreciate it. To this day, I still cringe when I tell that story because that could have gone so much worse. I had gotten one of the octets in the IP address wrong when I went after the system. I screwed up bad. I got away with it. I'm lucky. Never think about hitting back because it doesn't work because mistakes can easily happen. And it literally isn't result like it isn't just you. Vendors can do this too. So one organization I was working at, we had a vendor come in. They were a vulnerability scanning vendor, uh, still around today, and we'll leave it at that. They said, look, we have this great tool. We'd love you to try it out. We'll do a scan of your systems for free just so you can see an inventory and let us know how it goes. And we're like, yeah, sure, no problem. Here's a class B. They went, what? Well, we're a power company. We just have class Bs. And they're like, ah, oh, damn it. So <laughs> off they went, and they scanned the class B. Came back with a report, and they were good enough to print it out because they wanted to kill trees. The report was about this thick, and I was like, wow, that's crazy. I started flipping it through, and I'm like, Shanghai, Chongqing, Beijing, hold on. We don't have any operations in China. Printer, printer, pr there's a lot of printers available in China. And then it hit me. They had done the exact same thing that I did years earlier working for a defense contractor. They got one of the IP address part wrong. They got an octet wrong. They scanned an entire class B in China. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you may have just committed an act of war. Congratulations. They were so embarrassed. They were bending over backwards. They're like, please don't say anything about this. Don't blog about this. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. Because why? I've done the same thing. This can happen to anyone. That's why you have to be really careful. And you also have to be careful to help educate people on how to do things properly. When you're talking about teams in your own organization, you want to make sure that you're sharing information with them in a sane fashion, or things like this will happen. This was one organization, a, another power company I was working at. They had an app that went live, and they said they had bypassed security entirely. We hadn't had a chance to do a review. And they came to us about an hour after it went live, and they said, look, we'd love it if you could do a security review. OK, sure. No problem. We'll go. First thing I did is I opened up a web page. This is not the web page. I did view, source, right there. See that one right there? That right there? I did view, source. Can you imagine what I found commented out in the HTML? The person who yelled password is correct. Not only a password, username, admin, password, password. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? And then I went, wait. We hadn't had a talk before they went live. I'm not going to beat them up too badly. So we sat down, myself, the CISO, and the program lead that was dealing with this. And this was his reaction. You hacked my application. OK, let's go back just a second here. I did view source on a web page, and apparently I hacked his application. And I was about to go off. I was about to be this guy. And then it really hit me. At no point had he ever had a conversation with us about what our expectations were, what our requirements were, what security should be like. So rather than blowing my foot off, I sat down and had a reasonable conversation with him. And he got it over much gnashing of teeth. But that was just it. My initial reaction was, you moron. And I'm like, no, that helps no one. That absolutely does nothing to further the conversation. Now, sometimes even when you fix 
an application. Even time when you fix things in your own organization, they can become unfixed. So that organization that I got the data breach notice that was popped, we had one server that we got them locked down that was unrelated to that. And one said, okay, great. We, they, it was such a huge fight. It was months for them to secure the system. Two weeks after I left, I got an email from a coworker, former coworker, and said, you're not going to believe this. So the developer site, and then the command at the end was slash Etsy password. Had complete access, well, complete uh, visibility to all the accounts on the system. They had undone everything we had gone through to help them fix. Now, when you're dealing with users, when you're dealing with organizations in your own company, you have to understand that people are going to use tools in ways you never imagined. And sometimes they'll ask for tools that do absolutely nothing at all. They look pretty, but you want to make sure that you're making effective decisions for your organization and the wider public at large. Because bad things can happen. This is not to beat up on this company, but the first time I ever did this talk, this happened. This is a, a website called YourDataIsSecure.com. They had their entire SQL database on their front page. This was two hours before I gave this talk. I was like, <coughs> screen cap. Now, my friend Bob Lord, he now works for the, uh, the, the Democrats in the United States. He used to work for Yahoo and several other organizations, but he was there during the exposure of the data breach, and he had to live through that. And ultimately, he got hosted, hoisted on his own petard, but he just happened to be the poor guy that was left holding the, holding the bag at the end. And he said, going through a data breach feels like vertigo. And he's right. When I went through the data breach where we only had 192 accounts exposed, I felt horrible. I didn't sleep for days. The real effect of the organization, eh, not really there. But you take it personally. And sometimes things happen, and you don't expect them to happen. Like when the Morris worm got out. This was never supposed to do what it did. It caused all sorts of damage. And we tend to look at things in a very much in an adversarial way. It's like, oh, it must have been an attack. And when we tend to look at everything as a nail and we only have a hammer, it tends to be a really bad thing. But as security practitioners, we have a really bad habit of becoming our own worst enemy. We tend to eat our own. And as a community and building a community, much like we have here, this is something where you help to build each other up because it can be so much better. When you're looking through the types of things that you need to deal with in a data breach, there are all these different types of groups and organizations that you can work with to build out. You don't want to be that individual uh, standing there with a flaming sword of justice saying, the answer is no. You don't want to be the person with the mantra of how do we get to know, because that doesn't work. Now, the other organization you really want to deal with, audit. Nobody tends to like audit very much. I worked in one financial organization, or institution rather, we had 55,000 employees, and we had an audit team of seven people, and they, I swear, they just wanted to have my pelt hanging on a wall, because they were never trying to help further the goals, they were always trying to take me and my team out. And I found this very disconcerting. And then I went away and I thought about it for a while. And I thought, how do I make this better? So I took the lead uh, from that audit team and I went out and had a coffee with them. And we sat down and we talked. And after a while, I realized the way to work with them is to work with them as opposed to an adversarial relationship, which had done no good up until this point. And I said, look, how do we do a better job at our job? And he looked at me, and he was so incredulous that he actually rolled back in his seat and he thought about it for a second, and then he started coming up with ideas. And that helped build that dialogue where we were able to improve things. Because as you're going through this, you want to have allies within your organization to help better secure that organization, because when the bad news comes, you want to be able to better communicate it internally as well as externally as required. The vulnerabilities are going to keep coming. Making sure that you have something along the lines of a zero trust infrastructure to help mitigate that, great. I'm not caring about a zero day, I'll be honest. When you hear news about a zero day, it's amazing how much churn happens as a result of it. How many C-suite -exec -C executives are saying, okay, I need a meeting with you to discuss this, understand the risks and all the rest of it, well, great. Okay, well, we don't have that particular software anywhere in our organization. Oh, yeah, but we still need to talk about it because we need to have visibility. We need to understand in case the board asks. Okay. That's a lot of wasted time. The thing that I'm worried about is the 100-day vulnerabilities. The database patches that have not been applied for two years. 
these are the concerns that I have. And these are the things that we need to help better address. So a lot of the questions that I get when I have this sort of conversation is, where do we start? And most people don't know where to begin. Honestly, you start where you are. Do you have a risk register within your organization? That is a simple one. Tracking the vulnerabilities, the exposures in your organization, and having some sort of plan in place in order to address them. This is remarkably absent in a lot of organizations. You want to look at how are you doing patching within your organization. Are you worried about a low-level patch, or are you worried about a critical patch, or what is your risk appetite? Are you doing regression testing on patches? My favorite are the individuals out there that are like, oh, we got to patch it right now. And I'm like, okay, wait. That is a power system that has been in the field for 30 years, and in order to patch it, we have to take it offline for six weeks. Yeah, it doesn't quite work out that way. You have to have some sort of compensating controls as well as a plan on how you're going to mitigate that because not all systems are created equally. You want to figure out how to stop the threats earlier. You want to have some sort of anomaly detection in place to look for these individual threats. And how are you going to address them? How are you going to even know that they're there? I love this cool breeze that's coming through the window right now. Sorry, sidebar. <laughs> Um, thank you for the person who opened the window. Um, a lot of times in organizations, the people keep saying, you want to innovate, you want to innovate, you want to innovate. But how do you innovate if the plane isn't already built yet? How are you going to deliver that if you don't have that structure in place? Security isn't there to stop people from doing things badly. We're here there to help secure the business to do things in a safe and secure fashion. And you want to do it in such a way that you're seen as a value add as opposed to a detractor. Because historically, too often, we were seen as the flaming sword of justice, the detractor, the one that was saying no to everybody. That doesn't help. We can do a better job than that. We also want to make sure that we're managing the narrative. The media loves to take hackers and that term, rather, and smear it through as you know, these horrible, horrible people. But sometimes we really got to stand up and say something, because this was a few years back where CNN went on and talked about a hacker named 4chan that had compromised their, excuse me, a hacker named 4chan that had gone through and caused all this trouble. And it's like, no, that's not how this works. All right. So as I start winding down, I'm going to talk a couple of uh, war stories. <laughs> In one, the one organization I mentioned earlier, we had this global network that was MPLS circuits as far as the eye could see. And we got a notice from an American organization called the MPAA and also another one called RIA. And they said that we were eagle, uh, illegally downloading music as well as movies. And we went, what on earth are you talking about? We have no interest in this whatsoever. And they screamed up and down and their lawyers were causing us all sorts of heartache and we're like, okay, there's something very wrong here. This couldn't be happening. We were looking at our firewall logs. There was nothing to show any of this sort of traffic. In a certain country in Southeast Asia, we had a facility where we had one of our team was there, and we had him do a physical walk around. What did he find? He found a stub network off the core router that the locals had built so that they could bypass all the controls. So we were looking at the logs for the firewall, which was fantastic, but we weren't looking at the edge routers. Epic fail on our part. And this is one of those things. You want to make sure you're looking at the right things. You're learning from the right information. Sometimes things that look good can also be a curse and tends to how you're going to balance that out. Another power company that I worked at years ago, this was a great one. We had this bizarre routing error that was happening. We couldn't figure out why. We went through and we started going, okay, enough. Finally, we have to go out to the floor and start lifting tiles. So tile number one, got my tile lifter, nothing there. Tile number two, okay. This is an all in front of all of the networking racks. Tile number three, oh, hello. There was a Cisco 1750 under the floor going, hi. Nobody knew why that was there. Nobody knew what it was connected to. Within a couple of hours, we were able to figure out that this was part of another company. Now, backing up one step, our company used to be part of a larger organization that was split into five separate companies. One of those companies was eh, sort of a competitor, and that was a direct connection back to that company. 
wow, we lost sleep that day. But the really interesting thing is we talked to our friends over at that organization, and they didn't know it was there either. <laughs> they found a similar 1750 under the floor, and they went, okay, let's just unplug this and make sure that it goes away. Constantly have to be looking for where these issues can crop up. Security issues can find you in the most unbelievable ways, and not because of any malicious intent. That was something that was put in place, I'm sure, for a logical reason years ago, but when the companies all divested each other, nobody caught that part. You want to make sure you document everything. You want to make sure you're clearly communicating with everything, everyone, and you want to make sure that you're working with other organizations within your company or your uh, education or government, whatever it happens to be, to make sure that you're sharing that information. Much like you have here today with B-Size, you have an ability to interact with your peers. Take full advantage of that. Contribute back to this because this is something that can grow. B-Size Toronto started in a horrible greasy bar year one. This, I would have loved to have had this when we started. That being said, I would like to say very much tak, and thank you very much for taking the time to listen and thank you for having me. And a huge thanks to the B-Size organizers, and if there's any questions. Yeah, are there any questions? All right, I have one question for you. Shoot. Um, you mentioned uh, that there's a lot of uh, the communication, and we wait for something to happen rather than act proactively. We, we want a breach, it would seem, to the, to the alien observer who understands IT but not humans. Uh, it would seem that we, we want breaches to happen. So. Uh, do, do you think that if we, uh, if we could find better ways to quantify risk, maybe instead of using something like a, a risk matrix, would that help? Or Yes, that would absolutely help. You want to have a way to communicate to the wider audience because we got to stop assuming that everybody not in security understands what we're talking about. We're very good about talking amongst ourselves in our own lingua franca, but we're very poor at communicating to a wider audience that does not understand what a zero day is or anything to that effect. Anybody else? Better question? Any question? No? Okay. Oh, 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 there's one. All right. Coming down. And also, if you don't want to ask a question in person, you can always email me. I'm totally up for that. So you said uh, 10 years ago we were talking about millions of records breached and that was scary. Now we're talking about billions. Do you think at some point of time in the future there will be so many data breaches that nobody would care anymore? I, I honestly worry that we are at that point we are now getting numb to it and that does really concern me. Static usernames and passwords are something that, you know, for all intents and purposes, started in 1962 with a uh, program called CTSS at MIT. They were using it to help control people's access to supercomputing time so that people wouldn't steal time from each other because each student had four hours allotted to them. And that was a reactive control. Today, we're still using passwords as a default method to help secure things. And we, all, we also do a poor job of securing our infrastructure at large because we want to do everything faster, better, and all the rest of it. But often, security gets overlooked. So yes, I think we are at that point where we are now starting to get numb to it. And I also think it's time for us to get rid of static usernames and passwords and do a far better job of getting back to the core fundamentals to secure our organization. I hope that answers what you're after. Yeah, I think passwordless is the future. Uh, absolutely. WebAuthn is a open standard that was just ratified a couple weeks ago. If you don't, actually, that's a great example. If you are not familiar, WebAuthn, go look it up. Um, this is a great standard. This is the next step for passwordless authentication. And no, I didn't pay him to say that. Uh, yes, we have. <laughs> Sorry, we have somebody over here. Oh. Hi, thank you Hello. very much for the talk. Um, I'm a developer, so I'm approaching this from a developer perspective. And when we develop applications, we often add security as an afterthought. Yeah. So we develop it first, we ship it, and then someone says, hey, like you said, this S3 bucket is publicly accessible. So how do you sort of change that mentality so that we develop with security first instead of after? I completely agree. So, uh, caveat, I'm, or not caveat, I'm sorry, uh, example for me, my first job in IT was actually a rapid application developer. So I started out that, but on the side, uh, when I was at home at night, I was breaking into systems because, you know, that was the thing to do. The thing that I realized is people were not communicating with developers what security was. And I sort of bridged both worlds so that I had some inkling towards it. 
And I started doing more in investigation into that. And that was one of those things where, yes, developers, we have to stop beating up on them because we often don't share what we expect in advance. And that's just it. When something goes wrong, we're like, you, what, you should have fixed that. That doesn't help. So yes, we as a security community need to do a better job of communicating what we expect of them and what those standards are to better secure them. I hope that answers. OK. Thanks for the question. And I Great. Guess, yeah, All right. I want to make sure there's time for the next speaker to cut up. Yeah, sure. Um, we have a, a small token of our appreciation. Uh, on behalf of the B-Sides organizers and everybody here, I'm sure. As a foreigner, you get our special gift, which is, uh, <laughs> is a, uh, a book written by Norway's favorite Canadian, actually. <laughs> Julian Esperell, so from, from two Canadians to another. There you go. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, since you're leaving at 1.30, you won't get to see any Norwegians uh, smiling. Well, oddly <laughs> enough, they, resem they resemble Canadians. <laughs> thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you. Cheers.